Chapter 16, blood. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the components of blood, so plasma and cellular elements. We'll discuss blood cell production and specifically look at red blood cells and platelets and how they're involved in blood clotting or coagulation. So our blood is made up of plasma and cellular elements. So the cellular elements would be our blood cells. So we have our red blood cells, also known as our urethrocytes. We have our white blood cells, also known as our leukocytes. And then we have our platelets. Now the platelets are formed from uh, pieces essentially breaking off of these big cells called megakaryocytes. Now there are different types of, if we go back to white blood cells, we have different types of white blood cells. We have lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. We'll discuss more about white blood cells and their function when we get to the immune chapter uh, later on in the term. So for this week, we're really going to focus on our red blood cells and our platelets. Now, plasma is basically everything else in blood. So really, we have a lot of water. So most of plasma is water. And then dissolved in the water, we have our ions like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. And then we have organic molecules like our amino acids, proteins like albumin, globulin, uh, fibrinogen. We have our glucose in our blood. We have our lipids and nitrogenous wastes. There are also trace elements and vitamins, and we also have some gases that are actually dissolved in the plasma, both oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the process of making new blood cells is called hematopoiesis, and depending on which blood cell we need, we will um, respond to uh, the appropriate hormone. For example, when our um, receptor sense that we are low in oxygen. When our tissues are hypoxic, our kidneys will release the hormone urethropoietin, and it'll stimulate the process of urethropoiesis, which is where we make our urethrocytes, or our red blood cells. So depending on what we need, we'll respond to, uh, we'll release the appropriate hormone and respond appropriately. Now, one thing we can look at in terms of blood is the uh, blood's hematocrit, and the hematocrit is just a ratio of your red blood cells to the plasma. So basically, after they've taken your blood, they'll spin it in a centrifuge, which separates our cells based on weight, um, and then we'll see our packed red blood cells at the bottom, and compared to overall plasma, um, uh, a male's hematocrit should be about 40 to 54% red blood cells. Females range from about 37 to 47%. Now, where do our blood cells actually come from? Well, they are created, matured, and released from our bone marrow. Now, that's true for most of our blood cells. The only exception would be our T cells. So they do, they are created or born here in the bone marrow, but they'll actually migrate to the thymus gland to mature. Um, again, that will be discussed more when we talk about the immune chapter. But other than that, every other blood cell, it will be born here, in the bone marrow and mature here in the bone marrow. Now we know that structure is equal to function and so when we look at our blood cells, um, if the structure of our blood cell has changed, if its morphology, shape has changed, it will give us a clue about what may be happening in our body. So here in this image, these images, the middle figure is actually what a normal red blood cell looks like. It has what we call a biconcave shape. So essentially it looks like a donut without the middle completely hollowed out. If you take a look at your blood cell and it starts to look like this, so it's a spherical shape, that tells us that water has actually rushed into our red blood cell. Now remember water follows solutes and so that lets us know that our uh, blood has less solutes compared to the red blood cell. So our red blood cell is in a hypotonic medium, and as a result, water goes from hypo to hypertonic um, areas, and so water rushed into our red blood cell and it caused it to swell. On the other hand, if our red blood cell looks like this, it's essentially shrunk. Water has exited our red blood cell, and so um, our red blood cell is in a hypertonic medium, and so water rushed out of the cell into the more hypertonic solution. Now, when we make red blood cells, um, again, we respond to urethropoietin, the hormone, to do that, but there are certain things that we need in our diet, and one of the most important is iron. So here's iron coming in through our intestine. We'll absorb it, and remember, 
our bone marrow is where we're gonna make our red blood cell. So we'll use the iron to create our red blood cell, which is made up of hemoglobin. So we have hemoglobin inside of our red blood cell. Now red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they actually live for about 120 days. And after that, they've been sufficiently damaged where um, they now need to be broken down. So because they don't have a nucleus, they can't repair that damage. So one organ that plays a big role in the breakdown of red blood cells is our spleen. So our older red blood cells will go to the spleen where it gets destroyed. Hemoglobin will get released and the white blood cells in the spleen will convert it into bilirubin. The liver will then conjugate that bilirubin. It just means it'll attach it to something and then it'll used, use that conjugated bilirubin to make bile. And remember, the liver makes bile and stores it in the gallbladder. And when we get to the digestive lecture, you will see that we will then use that bile to help digest fat. Um, if the liver is not working, let's say we have liver failure, then what happens is the bilirubin that's um, created starts to build up in the blood. And so that bilirubin is actually still unconjugated. The liver didn't bind it to anything and that unconjugated bilirubin building up in the blood leads to jaundice and that's that yellowing of the skin. And a lot of newborn babies have jaundice and what they'll do is they'll put them under sunlight and that helps the skin um, convert the bilirubin into something that the body can then process and remove from the body. Now one condition or one issue related to red blood cells is anemia. So anemia is basically a lower oxygen carrying capacity than normal. So your capacity, your ability to carry oxygen has reduced. And it can reduce two ways. One is you might have accelerated red blood cell loss. You're losing more red blood cells than you normally should. Or you might have decreased red blood cell production. You're not making the normal number of red blood cells like you should at the rate that you should. So what could cause each of these? So some examples of why you might have accelerated, accelerated red blood cell loss includes just bleeding. Maybe you had an injury and you are hemorrhaging out blood and you're just losing whole blood. So that will obviously mean you have less red blood cells um, than normal because you're losing a lot of those red blood cells. So that can lead to anemia. You might also have some hemolytic issues. So hemolytic anemias occur when your red blood cells are actually rupturing at a higher rate. So they're getting destroyed quicker. Now that can happen with hereditary issues, so membrane defects. And an example is hereditary spherocytosis. So this is a genetic disorder where your red blood cells, instead of having that biconcave shape, they're more spherical. And these spherical uh, red blood cells aren't able to hold up um, as it's being circulated in the bloodstream. And so the membrane gets damaged quicker and so they get destroyed quicker. Maybe there are enzyme defects that are causing your red blood cells to get destroyed or maybe you have an abnormality in the hemoglobin, for example, sickle cell anemia, where your red blood cells are actually sickled and we'll take a look at that. There's also some acquired um, issues. So acquired means you weren't born with it, but you acquired it. So maybe a parasitic infection like malaria. So malaria will actually cause red blood cell destruction. Certain drugs and autoimmune reactions can also destroy red blood cells. Now, you could also become anemic because you're not making your red blood cells like you normally should. Now, aplastic anemia is just caused by certain drugs or radiation that really just impacts your bone marrow, and it causes it to not work and create red blood cells like normal. But there can also be issues related related with an inadequate diet. So remember, we need an adequate diet to make our body's proteins, um, cells, including our red blood cells. So we already mentioned how we need iron to make red blood cells. So iron is necessary because um, it's in our hemoglobin. So we have iron containing heme group within the hemoglobin that actually carries oxygen. So without that iron substrate, we can't make red blood cells. And so iron deficiency is actually the most common diet deficiency um, that leads to anemia. There's also folic acid deficiency. So folic acid is required for DNA synthesis. This is why a lot of women who get pregnant will take extra folic acid. And then we have vitamin B12 deficiency. That's also um, related to DNA synthesis. And um, people who have a specific type of vitamin B12 deficiency where it's not due to the fact that you're not 
eating vitamin B12, it's actually due to the fact that you're not absorbing it into your body from the intestine. That's known as pernicious anemia. And that occurs when you have a lack of something called intrinsic factor. So in your stomach, you have these cells called parietal cells, and it'll come up when we talk about the digestive lecture, but they release intrinsic factor. And that intrinsic factor is required to absorb vitamin B12 in our GI tract. So some people don't have that intrinsic factor. As a result, even though they might be ingesting vitamin B12, it's actually not getting absorbed. And so that can lead to anemia. And then maybe you have renal failure. Maybe your kidneys are not working. Now, why would that lead to anemia? Because remember, that hormone urethropoietin that stimulates the process of making new red blood cells is made by the kidneys. So when your kidneys fail, it'll also fail to make that hormone. And so that will lead to reduced red blood cell production. Now, let's briefly discuss sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia results when there's an issue with the beta chain of your red blood cells, hemoglobin. Now it is a genetic defect in which glutamate, the amino acid glutamate, which is the sixth amino acid in a chain of 146 um, that make up our beta hemoglobin chain, that one amino acid is replaced with valine. And just that one altered amino acid leads to sickle cell anemia. And that one altered amino acid is all due to a result of one incorrect nucleotide. So remember, our DNA gets transcribed into mRNA, and then the mRNA calls over the appropriate tRNA that's carrying an amino acid. Well, when we have one incorrect DNA, then we're going to have one incorrect mRNA. And so that mRNA codon, the three nucleotides, will call over the incorrect tRNA carrying in this case, the wrong amino acid. So, um, okay, so basically, if you have these sickled red blood cells, um, they're more likely to cause clots. So if you have these red blood cells that look like this, um, flowing through your blood vessels, then anywhere you have blood vessels that are going to split, you're gonna get these guys kind of creating little clots. And so you can get micro infarcts. Um, in addition, these red blood cells can get um, destroyed quicker, and so you lose red blood cells quicker as well. Now, it doesn't mean just because someone has sickle cell anemia, all of their red blood cells look like this. They'll have normal-looking red blood cells, but they tend to sickle in a deoxygenated environment. Okay, so let's move on to blood clotting. So um, hemostasis or blood clotting is important because when we have damage to our blood vessels, we want to make sure we're not going to bleed out. So how does it work? Well, we have our big megakaryocyte. Again, pieces will break off and those are your platelets. Now these platelets circulate in your blood. They're part of your cellular elements, but they don't always clot. So what happens is when you actually have damage to your blood vessel wall, collagen inside your blood vessel wall now gets exposed. And that exposed collagen will attract these platelets, causing the uh, coagulation cascade to essentially turn on, the clotting cascade to turn on. Now what will happen is you need to try to restrict blood flow to the area, you need to try to quickly stop the bleeding, and then you need a more permanent solution, and then you need to repair the tissue. So you'll do all of those things. So you will vasoconstrict, to reduce blood flow to the site of injury, so we're not gonna lose too much blood. We will also create what we call a loose platelet plug. And so what that is, is, is it occurs when these platelets aggregate. They kind of all come and create like a mesh, or I don't know if mesh is the right word, but they all kind of come and surround the injury, um, creating a plug that's not permanent, it's kind of a temporary solution. So now we need a more permanent solution. So the clotting cascade will create, or will do the following. You are going to uh, form something called thrombin. Thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and the fibrin is going to be what creates our reinforced clot. So that clot is our reinforced um, platelet plug. So this is a more permanent solution that's going to sit there and really make sure we are not going to bleed. And then what will happen is underneath, our tissue will repair. And once the tissue is repaired, the clot won't just break off. Because if it did, it'll get stuck somewhere else in a small blood vessel and, and cause a whole other host of issues with blood supply. So instead, what we now need to do is dissolve the clot. 
So the process of dissolving the clot is called fibrinolysis because now we're going to lyse or break down the fibrin that created our clot. And then we're done. So to review, we have platelets circulating in our blood, but only when our damaged blood vessel exposes collagen do our platelets start to aggregate. So here is our loose platelet plug. Notice this is a temporary kind of solution so that we are not massively bleeding out and hemorrhaging. We'll also vasoconstrict to kind of decrease blood flow. Um, so then we will create a more stable clot, and that will be initiated by what we call the coagulation cascade. So we will form thrombin. Thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin is going to create that reinforced clot. Then once the tissue underneath repairs, we need to then destroy the clot. We need to dissolve it, and that process is called fibrinolysis because you are going to lyse the fibrin. And so plasmin will help uh, you do that. So it's involved in the process of dissolving your clot. And that's it for this chapter. Thank you.